Lord, this morning, we thank you for your presence. God, even just pausing for a moment and letting it sit, we invite you into this place. God, we're here. We've showed up this morning. But Lord, it'll mean nothing if you don't show up. And so, God, we've all gathered here. We've got hearts that are ready to hear from you. But, Lord, we want to ask that, God, you would show up, that, Lord, you would minister to our hearts. Lord, there are people in this room that have not been to church in a long time. God, I pray you'd speak to them this morning. Lord, there are people that are really struggling. Lord, I pray you would reach down and get a hold of them. Lord, there are those that seem so distant, so far. Lord, you're the one that they need most. This morning, God, we want more of you. We invite you to be in this place. And Lord, we just say that we love you and there's no one like you. And so now, Lord, as we, we've worshiped, now, God, we ready our hearts. We want to hear from you. And so, Lord, we thank you, God, again for this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. You can be seated and thank you. Thank you, Dion. Thank you, Bailey. Hey, today is her due date, by the way. Okay, like today is her due date. So we need to keep her in prayer. So if she doesn't show up at the end, it's because she's going to the hospital. All right, that's the reason why. Um, but we're keeping her in prayer. So Bailey will be due today. We don't know when that baby's coming, but may the Lord be with her and the baby. Welcome to Jesus City. So glad to see many of you today. If you're with us for the very first time today, we want to say welcome. We're glad that you chose to kind of just come and have church service with us today. You know, we really view Jesus City as a place where anybody can come. I don't care where you're at in life. You know, you could really be close to God or far from God. We know this, that, that the Lord loves you. You know, it says on the big glass window when you walked in, it says, there's a God in heaven who loves you. And even if you walk away with just that reminder, God loves you today. He really does. And he cares about you. And so um, I'm glad you're here this morning. We have been going through a series called Family Matters. And this series is all about the relationships that really are in every stage of life. So we've, called, we've covered what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? We talked about even the dating relationships and how to find the right person for you. And so if you are on the hunt, if you're single and ready to mingle and you're looking for somebody, go back and watch that message. Um, we talked about what does it mean to be a godly husband? And this week we're talking about what does it mean or how to be a godly wife? How to be a godly wife. Now, before half of you check out because you're not wives, this is for you too, all right? Here's the reason why. Okay, if you are, say, single, um, whether you're a guy, you're, you need to pay attention because you need to look for this type of girl. If you're a gal and you're single, you're not married, then this is the type of girl that you want to be. If you, say, have gone through just a separation and right now you're in a season of singleness, uh, this is how you hit the reset button is you look for this or you model this. Or even as a youngster, this is the type of person that as a girl you pray to be, you know? So as a young woman, God, make me like this. Or as a young man, Lord, help me find someone like this. So, but for the rest of you wives, buckle up. It's going <laughs> to be a good morning, I promise. At the end, I'm going to have my wifey come up and she is going to kind of help me at the end really make this practical. And so the title of the message is simple, How to Be a Godly Wife. And I'm going to give you three areas that the Bible describes that you are responsible for. Things that you can really pay attention to. Now, there's a lot to do, but I want to narrow it down to these three and so my goal, my one sentence today is this. The goal of your life should not be to be a good wife, but to be a godly one. The goal of your life is not to be a good wife. There's lots of good wives out there. But the goal should be, I want to be a godly wife. A godly wife is the most rare and most valuable commodity that a man could ever find. There's nothing else like having a godly wife, one that loves Jesus and models him daily. Now, why is this the case? I would say it's because of, well, that first word, godly, a godly wife, someone that God has intervened into her life and has molded and chiseled and really fashioned for himself a, a wonderful woman that would go and love a man. Um, when I think about 
paintings, you know, I, I want to ask you, what is the most famous painting and most valuable painting of all time? What is it? It's the Mona Lisa. That is right. The Mona Lisa is the most valuable, the most rare, okay, and the most famous painting of all time. Did you know that it was Francisco de Giocondo was his name? Lisa's husband, okay, was the man that one day wanted to get a portrait made of his wife. And so one day, this man, Francisco, thought, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my wife's portrait done by one of the most famous men of our time, Leonardo da Vinci. And so he hunted out Leonardo da Vinci, and he asked him to paint a portrait of his wife. Da Vinci agreed, and it was there that he started his work. It took da Vinci four years to paint the Mona Lisa. Four years. It wasn't actually completed in seven years' time, but it was countless visits that Lisa was her name, that she had to come and sit before da Vinci so he could paint her, so he could create something that would become, well, more than he'd ever dreamed it to be. Did you see this painting uh, has a considered worth of $1 billion? It has 6 million people that visit the painting every single year. I've seen it. Has anybody been to France to see the Mona Lisa? Anybody here? Yeah, some of you. Military, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I was out there. I got to see it. I was actually like, it's tiny. You know, I'm like, what? That's so small. And it's seriously like this big. I was like expecting some grand. There's all of these tapestries in the Louvre Museum in Paris. And I mean, it's like just massive tapestries and paintings. And you're like, okay, where's the Mona Lisa? And you're like, it's a Tic Tac. You know, like it is like tiny. I'm like, what is this thing? But everybody from all over the world, they come to see this painting valued above anything and everything else. But what makes Mona Lisa's painting so valuable is the question. Is it Lisa? No, okay, she's, okay, you know, she's on there. You can tell her like, okay, you know, maybe it's not her. Is it her family? She had a notable family, but it wasn't her family. What made Mona Lisa so famous? What makes the painting so valuable is not her, but it's the painter. The painter is the reason why that that painting is so valuable. The price is valued because of da Vinci. It was da Vinci's hand that did all of the work that made it so valuable. She sat there and God made her fearfully, wonderfully made, but it was da Vinci's hand. And this is what I think this morning for you ladies. There's lots of ladies out there that are good ladies, but there's very few that are godly ladies. To be a woman that has allowed the Lord himself to chisel and to paint and to put a work upon you, what makes you valuable is that you have come from the master's hand, that you are a work of the Lord himself. If you are a godly woman, the Bible says this, Proverbs 31, who can find a virtuous wife? Her worth is far above rubies. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she is to be praised. According to the Bible, a woman that is fashioned after the Lord himself, someone that fears God, a lady that loves him, she is praised above all of the jewels and all of the riches that this world could offer. She is to be sought after. She is the one that you desperately need to find. And that is what I'm hoping today you ladies will become. I'm sure some of you, many of you are already godly ladies and your husband is blessed to have you, but there's always room for growth. There's always groom, room for improvement here. Now, when I think about today's idea of what a wife is, I think I'm sadly disappointed. Why? Because all we see today in the news and even on social media is not the biblical idea of what a wife is or what a wife should be. I mean, you scroll Instagram and you will not see a, a, a pure, chaste, godly woman. Okay, that will not be the thing that gets millions of likes next to it, but it'll be something completely different. You would rather find her from Sodom than you would from uh, the, the heavenly city, Jerusalem. It's shocking to me um, that the world prizes such ladies that are not that valuable in the end. It's not a shock that when we look at marriages today that they're falling apart. It's not a shock that boyfriends and girlfriends are living together and that's viewed as okay and normal. You know, like test drive the car before you buy it, right? That's the idea. Um, you know, they can live together for years and do everything that you want and just call it a marriage. Like, not in God's eyes. 
That's not the way that it works. God has higher plans and higher designs for marriage than this world could ever come up with. Marriage done God's way is something amazing and beautiful, and it glorifies Him. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that the church itself could push out marriages that have godly wives and godly husbands because what it models for the world is just how amazing Jesus is with his bride. Marriage is meant to be a picture of Jesus with the church. Now, the way you become a godly wife, it's by reading the Bible and looking to other godly wives around you so you can model it. When you pursue being a godly wife, I think it becomes a generational blessing. Like some of you have had godly moms where your mom was a godly lady or maybe even a godly grandma. And you remember your mom, she was a prayer warrior or your grandma, she was a prayer warrior. She was always dragging you to church. You had a drug problem, right? You were drugged to church by your grandma. Okay, that's, I'm praising, now he got it. Yeah, he said drug. Yeah, drug issue, drug that. I actually heard that in the church that we went to before this one. Uh, Montgomery City of Refuge, Pastor Robert White. He's like, I got a drug problem. My parents drug me to church. I was like, okay, that's good. That's really good. I like that. So I stole it and I'm giving him credit. Um, okay, back to it. When you become the godly woman that God has called you to be, the godly wife, it has generational impact. Not only does it impact your marriage, like your husband is blessed, but your children get to see what a godly wife looks like how a godly wife behaves, what she talks like, your, your grandchildren, and then also all the other ladies around you. It becomes a generational blessing where you are passing down these, these treasures to the, the ladies of tomorrow. And that's what Titus chapter 2 says. It says, older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children to live wisely and to be pure, to work in their homes, to do good and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. It says older ladies come alongside younger ladies and show them how to love their husbands, be submissive to their husbands, to do their husbands good. And all of this becomes a blessing for generations to come. Now, in the prepping of this message, I was like, okay, this is hard to stand up in front of ladies, you know, and, and try to preach a message like this. And so I love you ladies. This is out of a kind heart that I share these truths with you this morning. Um, it's not easy to be a godly husband it's especially not easy to be a godly wife. It takes a lot of selflessness, a lot of service, and a lot of sacrifice to be the godly lady that God has called you to be. It reminds me of that woman that went to the doctor's office with her husband because he wasn't feeling well. As his checkup finished, the doctor actually called her back into the office and said, I have to share something with you. Your husband is suffering from a very severe stress disorder. If you don't do the following he will surely die. She says, well, what do I need to do? He says, well, here's what you need to do. You need to cook three home-cooked meals a day. You need to be pleasant at all times. You can't burden him with chores and you can't discuss your problems with him. You can't nag whatsoever. You have to give him lots of affection and lots of love. You even have to let him go fishing so that he can just Clear his mind and relax. And if you do this for the next 10 months to a year, he will make a complete recovery. She leaves the office and on the way home, the husband looks over and says, honey, what did the doctor say? Well, honey, he said you're going to die. Um, <laughs> marriage takes hard. It's a joke. Okay. Like there it is. Laugh. There it is. Good joke. Um, Marriage takes hard work. It takes hard work where you ladies are, and it would seem that you are giving out so much beyond even your own ability. For marriages to work, it takes teamwork. I said last week, last time, teamwork is what makes the dream work. When both parties do what they're called to do, marriage thrives and God is honored. You see, the husband has a role to play, so the husband's not off the hook. And for those of you guys that missed out two weeks ago, uh, you can go back and watch the message. And we even have homeworks, devotions for you guys when you exit. I have it for the ladies today as well. But for you men, I printed off more if you did not get one. These are uh, a devotion to help you become a godly husband. But the husband, he's called to be the leader of the home. 
He's called to be the lover of his wife, and he's called to be a learner. Those are the three things that a husband is called to do and be. There are three this morning that I want to focus on for you wives. What is your side of the team? What is your end of the bargain? It's these three H's. Number one, you are called to give help. You are called to honor, and you're called to make the home a priority. I'll say it this way, to provide help, to give honor, and to keep the home according to the Bible. Now, why do we have these things? It's because the Bible talks about it, all right? The Bible mentions these areas, and it might come as a shock to some of you that these are what the Bible says, but the Bible's a lot different than the world's. And so we're going to go to what God says about marriage and what God says about being a wife and a husband. All right, so we're going to jump right in. The very first one, the first role, the first area that you're to focus on to be a godly wife is to be a help. I put this sentence, a godly wife is a helper for her husband. She's a helper for her husband. You remember back in the beginning with Adam and Eve? It was Adam and Eve there in the garden. God made Adam And after making Adam, he said, you know what? Something is missing. I don't know what it is, but something is missing. He had made everything, the birds, the trees. He made rocks and everything. I mean, he made waterfalls and rainbows and flowers. I mean, he made everything. And then he makes man. And for six days, he had been saying, it looks good. It looks perfect. I love it. I love it. Yeah, it looks great. But then he makes man and he says, you know what? Something isn't Something isn't right. There's something that is off. For the first time, God says no about something he made. And it was about Adam. It's in Genesis 2, 18. He says, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. I'll make a helper comparable to him is what the text says. What does it mean to be a helper suitable? It means that Adam was missing something. There was something about the the makeup of Adam that was not right. And as I said two weeks ago, man didn't need a dog. Okay, that's not what Adam needed. He didn't need a guy friend. He didn't need a sports team to watch. He didn't need a job to do. And he surely didn't need a Harley. What he needed was a woman. A woman. That's what Adam needed. God made Adam with a a gap missing, and that was a, a woman. A woman is what he needed to fill the void, the gap, to be the help in his life. Eve is what came next. Genesis 2, 21 through 22. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept. He took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. God made Eve to be a helper for Adam. That word helper in the Hebrew is the word ezer, and it literally means to help, to serve, to assist, or to be a lifesaver, a lifesaver. So Eve comes in to be the help that he so desperately needs, and he's missing out on. You ladies, you wives, you are the helper that your husband desperately needs. You know, and you're probably like, yeah, that's right. Amen. He definitely needs me. And it's true. He does need you. Your husband cannot get through this life without you. God made you in mind when he made your husband. And this idea of being a helper means to be called alongside to help out in a way that they need it. A woman was made to be a help for the man, according to the Bible. Now, the easiest way to get this, I think, according to the Bible, is like a tandem bicycle. You know, like, so here we've got a picture of a a house, and, you know, like, this is the first house they're moving into, and then you've got a couple on a bicycle. You've got this two-man bicycle. The idea of a helpmate is that you've got someone that's leading the way, but then you've got someone that's right behind you that is just as valuable, just as important. Someone that will fill an empty seat in his life, someone that will partner with him, someone that will follow his lead, someone that will work hard and pedal hard and, and you know, put just as much effort and, and care and sweat into it, someone that will walk the line right behind him. When the Bible talks about 
this idea of being a helper, it's not in relation to how valuable the woman is, but it simply talks about her role in relation to how God made man. Both of them together are what makes the bicycle work. You've seen these bicycles without the one on the back and it just looks awkward. It doesn't look right, but two together, that's the way God designed it to work. Now, the word that the New Testament uses for this, that definitely gets a lot of bad attention today is the word submission. Submission. The New Testament says this, Colossians 3, 18, wives be subject to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. You're like, ooh, that's, that, that, that's in the Bible? Yeah, that's in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 5, I'll put it on the screen. It says, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Submission. What does it mean? The idea of a husband and a wife tag teaming together for the sake of building not only a family, but also a legacy. The Bible says that the man is placed as the head, the authority in the home. He's the one that's at the front of the bicycle. Now, this idea of submission is not, I would say, abnormal. I mean, you submit to somebody in your life right now, every single person on the planet has someone that they're submitting to. Whether it's when you drive out of this building, drive, don't drive out of this building. When you get into your car and you drive away from this building, if you speed in Montgomery and you get pulled over, you will be under the submission. You will be subject to that police officer and whatever he decides to give you, okay, in, in right justice. If he wants to write you a ticket, then you're subject to him and to the law. Okay, we, we live under subjection to different things. This is not new. If two people arrive at the front door at the exact same time, you both can't get through at the same time. One of you is going to motion, no, you go, no, you go, okay, you go. You know, one of you submits yourself so the other person can go forward. If you're in the military this morning, you have a submission under rank. And that's exactly what the Bible describes is that the husband and wife relationship is like a rank inside the military. And so the wife is saying, I am just as equal, just as valuable, just as special in God's eyes. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, but there's a rank in which the husband has that the wife does not, which is good for the wife because who gets in trouble when Adam, when Eve eats the apple, who got in trouble? Adam did. That's right. Like Jesus came knocking on Adam's door. Like, Adam, what happened? You know, Adam was held responsible and the husband is held responsible for the wife in the marriage relationship. God holds the husband accountable. He has got a higher rank. And so the idea of husband and wife working together, the rank concept really helps. The opposite of the word helper is this. It means chief, boss, or leader. God established the leader to be the husband. When the wife attempts to be the leader of the home, she's going against the very makeup of her nature. God said, I'm going to make you a helper. So when you want to be the chief, when you want to be the head, when you want to be controlling, you're working against God's design. God made man to be the head and the wife to be the helper. When you submit yourself to someone, this is what you do, is that you, you pause on self-assertion. You're no longer independent. You're not demanding control or manipulating for the lead. You're, you're not undermining his decisions. You're not skeptical of his motives. And you're not nitpicking him as the leader. When you as an individual submit yourself to someone, you're, you're willingly saying, I'm with you till the end. And if it means we go off the cliff together, well, then I told you so. You know, like that's, it's, but you, you go together as a husband and a wife. It reminds me of that movie, Big Fat Greek Wedding. There's a scene in there where uh, the, the mom is talking and she's talking about the, the dad. And she, she says this, she says, the man may be the head, but the woman is the neck. And she can turn the head whichever way she pleases. And uh, <laughs> I watch it, I'm just like, oh my gosh. Like that's, that is definitely what the world attempts to do in marriage. Where the wife's like, you know what? Husband, you can say whatever you want, but I'm in the end, I'm gonna control this thing. Being submissive to your husband means that you're not trying to be the head. 
Anything with two heads is a monster, including a marriage. Does your marriage have two heads? Wives, are you attempting to lead your husband? Are you attempting to jump into the driver's seat? Two drivers will cause a wreck, and two leaders will cause confusion. According to the Bible, your responsibility is to come alongside in a helping way. I was looking at some books in regards to this, and one wife said this, in marriage, submission means that after my husband and I discuss something, we make our decision about from the color of the carpet in the living room to how we spend our money to the way that we discipline the issues with our children. If we disagree, we pray, but in the end, he has the final decision. I am submitting to his authority as the husband and as the head of our household. End quote. Another one I read said this, you help the team by not trying to follow or not trying to lead, but to follow. I don't fight for control, but I fight to stay close to my husband. She says the wife's submission to her husband is not conditional, even on him loving her or showing his unceasing care for her. The wife is called to be a helper to the husband. Number two this morning. And my wife will offer more on that in just a minute. Number two, honor. Honor. The wife is called to honor her husband. The little phrase I put is this, is a godly wife gives her husband honor and respect. The Apostle Paul says that as men are to love their wives, women are to respect their husbands. Ephesians chapter 5, I'll put it on the screen. This is what it says in regards to a wife with, with her husband. It says, so I say again, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. A husband has to love his wife. That is the command. That's what we're called to do is we have to love our wives like we love ourselves. How Jesus loves the church, that's how a husband loves his wife. But what does a wife need to do? It says that she needs to respect her husband. That word respect literally means to give honor or even fear. It's an interesting Greek word. It's the Greek word phobeos, where we get our English word phobia, okay, <laughs> which is like, what? What a random word to use. Um, here's some funny phobias, by the way. Ablutophobia, it's the fear of bathing. Hopefully some of you don't have that. Um, arithmophobia, the fear of numbers. That's what my son has when it comes to math homework. Um, <laughs> Optophobia, the fear of opening your eyes. Um, I don't want to get up in the morning. Ergophobia, the fear of work. Nomophobia, the fear of being without your phone. Have you ever had that? That's what my wife says I have. Okay, like I'm constantly, I've got my phone always on me. Okay, I've got nomophobia, the fear of not being, uh, fear of being without my phone. Then there's androphobia, the fear of being around a man. Um, That is not what Paul had in mind, telling you wives to be afraid of your husband's but really it's to have a sensible honor and respect for them. To have a a respect for your husbands. Do you respect your husband? Do you give honor to your husband? This can be, I would say, one of the most damaging things in a marriage that I have ever seen. It's a wife that disrespects her husband. Why did God say to honor? Because I would say deep within the heart of man is a longing to be respected. Just like there's a longing for a wife to feel loved, deep in the heart of man, we long for respect. There's something that rises up in a man when another man disrespects him, but when your wife disrespects you, there's something that shuts down on the inside. The Bible says, a foolish woman is clamorous. She's simple and knows nothing, Proverbs 9, 13. A continual dripping on a very rainy day and a contentious woman are very alike, Proverbs 27, 15. One of the greatest issues I see with wives is how they disrespect the husband that God has brought to them, the way that they speak and the way that they act toward them. Let me ask you wives, those of you that have a job and are working, if you were to say like, let's think about your boss, okay, your boss that you have. If you were to talk to your boss and treat your boss the same way that you've treated and spoken to your husband, would you still have a job? (laughs) Probably not, right? Like behind closed doors, the ways that you've talked, the things that you've said, 
If you've done that to your boss or if you've done that to anybody, if you did it to a cop when he pulled you over, okay, I'm telling you, or even if you treated me like that, there is a deep issue that we see is that oftentimes the person that we're to love the most and respect the most, we treat the worst and we give them the worst disrespect. God is calling you ladies to build up, not tear down. He's calling you ladies to show honor and respect and not disrespect and shame. Maybe this morning you're thinking, well, where do I start on that? I think the very first place that you start is you confess to God, God, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry for the way that I've treated my husband. I'm sorry for the way that I've, I've dishonored you, God, and the authority that he's put there. And you ask the Holy Spirit to convict you and to change you. You see, even though physical attraction can help a marriage, it will not sustain one. If there's disrespect in a home, it's only a matter of time before the man shuts down or in sometimes leaves. Do you honor your husband? Do you love him? Do you speak well of him? Do you talk good about him? Do you talk good to him? One husband made a a comment, my wife is always nagging me. I remembered to bring the stroller. I remembered to bring the diaper bag, the diapers, and an even extra set of clothes. All she can remember is that I forgot the baby. Um, (laughs) For those of you wives that have a tendency to nitpick and nag, and to backbite and to slander, to tear down with your words, do you think it's a shock? Do you find it as a shock that your husband is always spending time away from you? Why is he always in the garage? Why is he always out? Why does he not want to spend time with me? Because Proverbs 21, 19 says, it's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. Solomon knew. Proverbs 21, 9 says, it's better to dwell in the corner of a housetop then share a house with a contentious woman. There is something that causes a man to flee when disrespect is present. You want to bring your husband back? Respect him. Speak well of him. Give that back to him. He isn't a boy. He's a man. He's not one of your children. Even if he acts like it, don't say it. I've got three children and a fourth. It's you. Don't say it. Call out the best in your husband. Speak those honorable things over him. In a moment, my wife's going to come up and we'll talk about some of those items. Thirdly, lastly, I believe that God has not only called you ladies to look at being a helper and then look at giving honor, but then also the Bible makes it very clear that you're to focus in on making a home that is respected and well cared for. Number three this morning, a godly wife makes the home her priority. Genesis 2.24, uh, God said, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. The idea of coming together to make a brand new family. Four times in scripture, we have these words, leave and cleave. Leave and cleave to leave one relationship to form a brand new relationship. Notice what God highlights that needs to be left. He says, a man and a woman will leave their father and their mother. Why? To come together to make a brand new home. Back in the Jewish culture, we have a very special relationship between a a lady and her father. The dad always represented leadership and authority and instruction. He was the the leader, the head, the manager of the household. So when a young lady leaves that of her father, she joins to her new husband and the husband becomes that role. Different, better, but different. And then also as a young man, when a young boy, a mama's boy, um, when a mama's boy leaves his mom, when he cuts those ties, mom was no, you know, she used to be the, the source of affection. Mom is the source of affirmation and attention. Mom is the one, come here, mom's little boy, you know, like, you know, cleaning the wounds and loving and kissing him. And, you know, the man leaves mom and now joins his wife, where his wife takes on a new role. Not the same role as mom, it's different, but it's better. 
both leave and cleave to each other to form a brand new home, a brand new relationship. So when you say yes to your spouse, you say no to everybody else. God severs the deepest bonds, family, for a brand new marriage relationship. You leave and you cleave. You form a new home, new traditions, new focus. And this is exactly what Paul tells the young ladies to do. Titus chapter 2, I'll put it on the screen. Titus 2, 3, or verse 4 and 5, look what the instruction is given for the home from an older lady to a younger lady. It says this, old, older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and to be pure, to work in their homes, to do good, to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. It's interesting that the Bible gives wives the duty of being industrious in the home. Now, this is completely contrary to the society that we live in, right? I mean, when my wife and I got together, you know, I, I was praying. I had like a long list of all the things that I wanted in a wife, you know? And one of the things that I desired in a man is I wanted a wife that valued the home as being very, very important, more important than almost anything else uh, in, in her life. That's what I wanted in, in a wife. I wanted a wife that would say, look, I want to be at home where I can raise and disciple and pour into children, that I can create a home where we'll be loved. And, and I wanted that. That's what I wrote down. That's what I prayed for. That's what I longed for. And God gave me that. And so when I get together with my wife, you know, when we were dating, she's telling me, look, you know what I want to do? She's like, I don't want a career and I don't want a degree and I don't want these things. I want to be a godly wife and I want to hold down the home. And I was like, wow, like I literally prayed for that. Like that's exactly what I was praying for. And it was amazing for me to hear that one of the highest aspirations she could long after was to be an amazing wife and one that held down the home in a godly way. What is the number one reason why our culture is falling apart? It's because homes are falling apart. That's the reason why. You look at it, what's the number one reason why people are in prison? It's because of what? breakdown in the home, whether it's a fatherless home, okay, or it's a divorced home, like I think it's like 98% is a, is a broken family is what's represented in our, in, our, uh, in our prison systems. Like it's no shock that the breakdown of the family corresponds to the breakdown in our nation. It happens left and right. And why is it? It's because we've neglected what the Bible says about the role of husband and wife, where the husband is here leading the home and the wife is caring about it, prioritizing the home and saying, look, I'm going to help make a home where God will be honored and our children will be raised to love him and to know him. The instruction is that a younger woman must be a homemaker involved in domestic pursuits. Not only are they in the home, but they're productive at home. Industry in the home means that there's hard work, a lot of hard work. There's a lot of sacrifice. Being at home is not easy. I would say being at home is probably harder than keeping a nine to five job, you know, because you're, you can't clock out. Um, there's no like vacation time. Uh, there, there's no like bonus pay. There's actually no pay. Okay. Is what it is. Um, being, being at home, it is one of the most grueling, hard, difficult jobs there is. And often there's no thanks and there's no praise for it. But God calls the ladies to this wonderful task where your praise will happen in heaven one day, where there is cooking and cleaning and child rearing. It's there. This is not to say that the Bible is against husbands doing this. The Bible doesn't say that the husbands can't do any of these things. He should help where, um, where there is need and where he can help, you know, and especially at different seasons in the relationship. But when the wife keeps a home, it creates an environment where a husband can come and share time with his wife. It creates an environment where children can be raised with structure and order. As my wife comes up, I want to read to you what Proverbs 31 says about a woman in her home. Proverbs 31 says this, a woman, she selects wool and flax and works eager with her hands. She is like a merchant ship bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still night and she provides food for her family. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. 
In her hands, she holds the distaff, and her, she grasps the spindle with her fingers. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for they're all clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed with fine linen and purple. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She's clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the difficult days that come. She watches over the affairs of her household and she does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. That is a Proverbs 31 woman. Actually, here's another one. She's coming on stage. Proverbs 31 woman. Um, my, my wifey. Uh, hi, dear. Hello. Thanks, Johnny. Appreciate you. So I wanted to bring my wife on stage just for a few moments here as we wrap up to give some very practical advice on how to carry out and how to, uh, you know, put these things into, into motion, you know, because I mentioned three big things, honor and uh, help and also the home. Um, you know, I, I wrote down, dear, that, you know, these things can sometimes seem overwhelming, um, but there's some practical ways to live these things out. And I wrote down, you can do it with your head, your heart, and your hands. The things you think about, so how you think about your husband, how you, you know, Jesus said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, so the way you speak, and then also what your hands do. Um, my question for you is this, uh, the way that you think, how does the way you think about those three responsibilities help you as a wife when you look at the, the roles of husband and wife? Like, tell me what, what goes, what's going on in your mind as, as a wife? Well, I think one of the number one ways that the enemy tries to get in any of our lives is through our thoughts. And so as wives, it's extra important that we are following the command of scripture in Philippians chapter four to think on what is true and right and pure and lovely and noble about our husbands. Uh, because if our thoughts about our husbands are bad constantly and only looking at the things that we don't like, the areas that he struggles in, then that's gonna come out in the words that we speak. It's gonna come out in our attitude and actions. And I was listening to a message a long time ago about being a good wife. And one thing she encouraged us to do was write down all the things you love about your husband because it's easy to write down the things you don't like. Well, he doesn't do this and he doesn't do that. Okay, well, there's a lot of things he could write about you too. Oh. So watch out. Um, but what we did was write down our favorite things. And I shared that list with my husband about a week ago. I sent it to him in a text. And That's why you did yeah. that. Oh. And I wrote it, you know, I had written I didn't it know that. <laughs> it's in my Bible to remind me um, of all the reasons why I love you. And so some of the Praise things, God. Some of the, <laughs> okay. Some of the things that were on there were, you know, the most important thing, obviously, is that he's a godly husband. I mean, that's the number one thing. He loves God. You can't really ask for anything better than that. Secondly, I think one of the things I wrote down is that he's funny. I always laugh at his jokes. Even if no one else does, I'm rolling in the back, you know. Um, he always hears me laughing. And then, you know, just some sweet things. He's strong. I mean, come on. Look at these hey. shoulders. Hey. <laughs> hey. I love his shoulders and his blue eyes. And I, I wrote those things down, okay? So as wives, it's important that you, you take captive your thoughts about your husband, even if some of those negative things are true, okay? I'm not saying they're not true. But we take those captive to the obedience of Christ, as it says in the Scripture, and we think about things that are lovely about our husband. And that's not only going to change how you speak and the way you treat him, but it's also going to change your attitude and your heart uh, when you look at that list. Put it on your fridge if you have to. Put it on the, the bathroom mirror. Stick it in your Bible so that you can be reminded, okay, yes, there's mm. always going to be issues and things I don't like, but I'm going to choose to think about the things that I love my about my husband. So your thoughts are very important. It's pretty interesting. In 1 Peter chapter 3, it even says that if a wife is married to a non-believing husband, that she can by her actions model such a beautiful example of Christ that she could even win him to the Lord. So you can go, if you're married to a, a, a heathen dog, right? If you're married to a guy that doesn't know the Lord, 
First Peter chapter three is going to be very encouraging to you, saying that you know as you start focusing on the inward beauty that the Lord puts in there, instead of just you know the hair and the makeup and and always looking good, but you start acting like a godly woman, the Bible says you can actually deeply impact your husband for the sake of eternity. And so I like that. So you think the right things. Okay. So now, secondly, with your your heart, the words you say. Um, you know, I think about, <laughs> I, I wrote this down. Uh, this is a joke. Another joke, okay? Um, I'm, I'm prepping you guys. Uh, so the words that you say, I think have an impact on me. Uh, you know, I heard about a husband and wife that were driving down a country road for several miles, not saying a word to each other. Um, they got into a fight. And so an earlier discussion had led to an argument. Neither one of them wanted to concede their position. As they passed a barnyard of mules, goats, and pigs, the husband sarcastically says, are those relatives of yours? She says, yep, in-laws. Um, <laughs> so good. Oh, so good. The words you say matter. I think the words you say will either build up or tear down. I wrote down this verse. It's in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1. Okay, you're going to share it, then I won't steal it. Go for it. Yeah, well, it's so funny because God put that verse on my heart last night. So, yeah, it's almost like we're married, huh? Um, the Lord is so good. But I love this verse, and my mom shared it with me before I married Jason. And it stuck with me so convicting, too. And it says, a wise woman builds her house, but a foolish one tears it down with her own hands. And I'm like, man, it's so true. The words that we speak to our husband, are they building up your house or are they tearing him down? Words are so powerful. And I loved what you said about, you know, would you talk to your boss the way you talk to your husband? Would you talk to a police officer or someone in the military or someone that you really respect? Would you talk to them the way you talk to your husband? And if the answer is no, then there is something really, really wrong. Would you talk to God the way you talk to your husband? And so each and every day, the decisions that we make as wives, the thoughts that we think, the words that we speak, we're either building him up, building our home up, or we're tearing it down with our own hands. So that's, that's a pretty heavy calling and responsibility from God. It definitely is convicting. That's really good. So it's thinking the right things. It's saying the right things. So that's head, heart, now hands. Um, you know, using your hands for the right things. Like in relation to those three areas, the home, helping, and also honoring, what are some things with their hands that they can do? Like how does that, you know, play out? Well, I heard a quote once that said that um, if your husband can't find peace in his own home, then why would he want to be there? And I think the way that we can show our love to God first and our love to our husbands is how we take care of our home. It's important. Does your husband come home and feel like he can relax? He can kick off his shoes and, and lay on the couch if he needs to? Are you preparing meals? It, some of this sounds archaic. You know, the society that we live in, it's like he can cook his own meals. He can do his own laundry. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, that's not what God says. So who are you going to pattern being a wife after? What the world is telling you to do, which will destroy your marriage, or pattern it after God, what God wants you to do, which is be a homemaker. And what is a homemaker? Well, your husband should feel comfortable. He should have clean socks and underwear in his drawer. He should. He shouldn't be digging through there, oh, I don't have anything clean to wear. That's our job as wives. A hot meal's on the table. Of course, there's seasons when there's not, that's not practical. You may not be feeling well or there may be health problems. But for the most part, make sure you're getting your grocery shopping done and that your husband has a meal to eat when he gets home. And all of these things take preparation. It doesn't just happen. You have to prepare for it. You know, you get out your, your uh, calendar or your schedule book and you make notes. Okay, Tuesday I'm making chili. Wednesday we're going to barbecue. Thursday, you know, we're going to do this. Wednesday mornings I do the laundry. You know, you, you prepare for it so you're not stressed out. Um, but it's practical things. It's practical things that make it feel like home, not just a place where he kind of has to, as he said in Proverbs, run to the corner of the roof or out in the garage <laughs> because home is not home. And if your husband can't find home in your home, he may try to go find it somewhere else. 
And that's the last thing that you want. Because if you're not giving him that, he may start looking for it in another woman. And so it's your calling and your responsibility to be that wife. Hearts, hands, home. I love it. That was really good. Wow. Really good. <clears throat> when I think about also what you can do, you know, one of the amazing things I love about my wife is that it's what you catch your, your spouse doing. And I catch my wife praying a lot. So when I think about how she uses her hands, I see folded hands in prayer a lot. And it's a blessing as a husband to see your wife holding a Bible, to see your wife praying with the children or praying in general. And so I think not only are you building up, but you're also kneeling down and you're praying. And, and so I think, yes, it happens thinking the right things, saying the right things, doing the right things. Because in the end, it's not about being a good wife. It's about being a godly wife. That, that's really what matters most. Are you a godly wife? One that has been sculpted by God, painted by God, as we ended with Mona Lisa. She's valuable because da Vinci is the one that painted her. Has God painted you? Has God put his mark on you as a lady? Um, that is what you're to go after. And as Proverbs already said, which we ended, Proverbs 31, who can find a virtuous wife? Her worth is far above rubies. Charm is deceitful, beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she is to be praised. A godly wife. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me close in a word of prayer. I'm going to pray and then you pray too. Okay. Okay. How about you start? Okay. <laughs> All right. Father God, we just thank you so much for this just amazing morning that you've given us as a family in Christ. And God, I thank you that we can find who we are meant to be. We can find our purpose in your word. God, we won't find purpose anywhere else except for in your word, God. Thank you, Father, for these wives that are here this morning and these future wives that are here this morning that want to learn. God, I pray over each and every one of them that most importantly as as my husband said, Father, that they would love you, God, with all their heart, soul, and strength. And as they do that, they will become the godly wives that you've called them to be. So, Father, I pray a blessing on all these beautiful women this morning that they would truly desire to honor you by honoring their husbands, God. So I lift them to you. I pray for the difficult days that you give them strength, for the days that the enemy is going to attack them, that you would uphold them and strengthen them, God, and bless the marriages that are in this room, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. God, I do thank you for the ladies in this room and those watching online. God, I pray that you would empower them by your spirit to be all that you've called them to be. Lord, I pray that you would help them look to the word of God and not to the world to find out what a wife is to be. Lord, I do pray that you would raise up from even just Jesus City, from Montgomery, Lord, or forever people are watching, raise up, Lord, these wives that would love their husbands well and model for the generations to come what a godly wife looks like. And so, Lord, we, we thank you, God, and we, we love you. But even, Lord, I just pray for those wives, again, that have a difficult situation, a difficult husband, that, Lord, you would give them strength, you would give them patience, and that, God, you would get a hold of him, help him be the godly man that he's called to be. And so we love you, Lord. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, dear. That was awesome. She always adds the best part to it. She always does. Thank you, sweetheart. Um, two things I wanted to mention.